who were planning this innovation summit who wanted to focus on being forward thinking. And there was someone that came to mind, and all we have to do is read his book, Shaking Up the Schoolhouse. Very much forward thinking, very much a leader, a prolific writer, someone who uh, does an outstanding job speaking and communicating uh, his viewpoints. And with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Phil Schlecker. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. I hope to be happy. I was here after I'm gone. Um, we sometimes forget the American school designed for a very specific purpose, purpose at one time. They're designed to just guarantee the equal distribu distribution of knowledge to all the citizenry. That's what Thomas Jefferson argued for. And then to give a few people a chance to do something with that knowledge. The assumption was that most people would not be what we now call knowledge workers. Most people needed enough knowledge to conduct their own affairs, uh, fulfill their civic functions, uh, and, and do those things that required of them as, as citizens. But for the most part, uh, the elite were left to work with knowledge and work on knowledge. Elites like doctors and lawyers, journalists and school teachers, people who made their lives by studying things and working with knowledge. What's happened to us in the last 50 years is the need for knowledge workers has exceeded our capacity to produce them. That is, the schools essentially did not produce knowledge workers, you identified them. You gave everybody a grounding in knowledge, says here's how much everybody needs to know, a common core, what we now call a core curriculum. Here's stuff everybody needs to know. Now, given that, some people, as Jefferson said, are going to emerge as having the capacity to add to that store of knowledge, and they become the knowledge workers. Uh, du Bois, an African-American educator in the 19th and early 20th century, uh, called that the talented tenth. He said, we, we have a talented tenth who can do that sort of thing. But now we're saying we need 60, 70, or 80 percent of the people to be knowledge workers, and we have not designed our system to produce the capacity to work on and with knowledge, we simply identify those people who come to you with the natural abilities and natural inclinations to make that knowledge work possible. So what we're trying to, what is going on right now is an effort to standardize things more so that somehow or another we'll get more people who can work on knowledge. That's not gonna work. We're gonna have to understand it. If you're gonna customize, we're going to have to understand that customization starts not with a known product, but with the customer. And then you ask yourself, what does the customer want and need that we, that in this product line that we've got, and what are they going to add to it? If you, if you take a look at customization and how it occurs, uh, it occurs because someone says, this is something I think would appeal if we change our product this way a little bit to fit the needs of this particular market niche. Uh, I'll, give you an, I'll give you an example, tell you a story. I am from Ohio. And I taught in the Columbus area for quite a few years and did some student teaching here. I did my, uh, actually taught at Worthington for about four years. Uh, and uh, I also did some substitute teaching. And one time I was a substitute teacher in a school that had a lot of kids from Appalachia and other kids from Mississippi. And the kids from Mississippi tend to be in migrants who were, who were African American. The Appalachians were white. And I had a, a group of ninth grade boys and it was almost all boys in this one class who were in the class because uh, they had scheduled PE, physical education, back in those good old days. Uh, and we had PE for the girls one period and PE for the boys the other period. That left me with a bunch of kids called boys in one class and girls in another class in called world history. Now, think about what I'm confronted with. I've got a bunch of Appalachian kids and, and kids in migrants from, from uh, South Carolina, North Carolina, Mississippi, and I'm supposed to teach them world history, and it required that they do that. And the topic that I was supposed to address was classical Greece and classical Rome. Now, can you think of anything that turned their souls on more than that? I mean, that, that's quite a challenge. So I said to myself, self, what am I going to do here? And so I said, well, I've got to teach this subject, and they're not interested in this subject. So how can I find some subject they're interested in 
that will require them to learn this subject. Because if they don't learn this subject, that's what's going to show up when, when they're asked test questions. But if I give, try to get them to do that, they're just going to rebel. So how can I design a unit of work that will result in their learning what I want them to learn even though they don't want to learn it because they want to do something else? I said, what do I know about these boys? One of the things I know about these boys is they like cars. They are all a bunch of night, you know, 13, 14, 15 year old boys, 13, 14, 15, and they like cars. So there used to be a guy who lived in this town by the name of Nicholas. I don't know if you remember Jack Nicholas. His, his daddy used to run out, well, they still have Nicholas drugstores or not, but they had Nicholas drugstores. And I went to the Nicholas drugstores and I bought all the car magazines I could find, and I cut out cars and, two, and, and any picture of any car I could get, and I put them in, in a manila folder, and I took, took them to the kids, and I said, now what I want you to do is I put them in round tables, or we've got to get, get the chairs together around, but we didn't have tables in those days, and said, what I want you to do is take these pictures. I had 10 or 15 pictures in each sack, and I want you to put them in two categories. Those that are classics, and those that are not classics. Classic cars and non-classic cars. And when you get done, I want you to make a list of the reasons you put the classics in the classic list. And they did. And they, they really had a lot of fun, because they love cars. And I said, now, I wonder, they came up with a statement, and I said, now tell me why you called them classics. Well, one of the first things they did was they said, well, it has lasting value. It lasted, they didn't use that word, but eventually I got them to see what they were saying when they had last, it has lasting value. Value. It was worthy of imitation. I remember that was another one. And they had five or six of those kind of statements. I said, now, I said, we've got a history book here. I said, I want to challenge you to test something out. So we got two chapters in that book. One says classical Greece and one says classical Rome. I said, I'd like you to take your definition of classical and read that, those chapters and see if there's any reason that the author might have called those classical, that the classical period of Greece and the classical period of Rome using our definition. And these kids got all excited about it. And all once they were reading for meaning, something they wouldn't have read at all. Now, when they got all done, they didn't care anymore about classical Greece and classical Rome than they did before. <laughs> but they learned some stuff about classical Greece and classical Rome because I'd customized, I didn't understand it then. But what I'd done is customized the lesson. I said, what do I know about the customer? What are the interests the customer has? Now, how do I design work for that? I want to give you another story. I have a grandson, 11 years old now. His mother works for me. And she's my fishing buddy, used to be. She's gotten too busy now, so her boss won't let her off work. Uh, but <laughs> but she, used, she used to fish with me. And, and I taught her how to cast. A, when she was about five years old, I taught her how to cast. And so I took her out in the backyard, and I had a hula hoop, and a Zebco 202, and a line, and I'd ca she'd cast it out and we'd bring it back in, and she learned how to do that, and I gave her, you know, I, I used my best uh, skill development lesson plan, uh, you know, demonstration, uh, give them an opportunity to practice, give them corrective feedback, you know, all the stuff you learned in your methods courses over here in ed education, and it worked. So my grandson got to be about the same age, and I decided to take him out and teach him how to cast. And so I took him out to teach him how to cast. And I took the same lesson plan. I had to buy a new hula hoop, the old one had disappeared by this time. And I had to buy, buy a new uh, uh, rod and reel because the old, old one had gotten broken up somehow. But I brought, I brought, him, brought him this equipment and we got in the backyard. And I said, now Dan, Daniel, let me show you how, to, let me see it, Grandpa. I said, wait a minute now, let, let me show you. Well, let, let me try it. Well, he wanted to try it and he didn't know what it was. And I struggled with him to try it. Because I was, you know, I was hell bent on teaching him. And he, I found out later he was hell-bent on learning. <laughs> and we were having an awful struggle. I, whether I was going to teach or whether he was going to learn. Because he didn't learn the way I taught. I had, I had a standardized process, and his daughter, my daughter didn't respond to it. But what he had done, he'd grown up with computers. And he'd grown up where he had random access, and he could touch it here, and he could touch it there. And he learned how to learn differently. If we're going to appeal to the kids that we've got today, we've got to understand that they access knowledge very differently than the, I did, and even their older brothers and sisters did. If you take a, take a look at what's going on in the world right now in terms of toys, 
Go, go this, this Christmas, I, I check myself. I make, make these statements, wild statements and speeches, and so every once in a while I have to get some empirical facts. And so I go to Toys R Us, you know, and, and look. And you take a look at the toys that kids are getting, getting today. Contrast with the toys they got five years ago. If you have children that range five years apart, and you take your, your five-year-old, that's the oldest, and then watch your one-year-old when the one-year-old becomes five, I'll guarantee you they're not going to have the same toy experience because the toys are changing so rapidly. And any kindergarten teacher that thinks that they understand how these kids are learning, they better be watching them every year because they're the things are changing fast and they're learning how to learn in a very different way. If we're going to really confront the realities of our, our schools and our, our lives, we're going to have to learn how to customize work. What does that mean? That means we've got to be, understand what motives kids have. You know, I think one of the biggest mistakes we make in education is to talk about motivating students. Students are motivated. Every, I've never met an unmotivated student yet. They just don't happen to be motivated to do what I want them to do. <laughs> but they've got other motives. And if you can understand what their motives are and then design work that appeals to those motives, you might get them to learn what you want them to learn. And so the real trick is designing work that appeals to their motives. What, what I spent my life doing is trying to identify those, those areas of, of life which, which are important to motivating kids. And let me get, give you some examples. If I had you know, a couple hours, I could talk about it, write books about it. It's hard to talk in eight minutes or so about something you write books about. But uh, we all, any teacher that's ever thought about it a minute knows that one of the things that makes a difference is content. If the kids like the content, you don't have any trouble motivating them, right? They just, that's why we like to teach uh, courses where they elect themselves because we know that you're going to have, we more likely have kids who want the subject. Got one minute, right? Oh, my God. I got 10 more things to say. Uh, so, so what we have to do is design the work. So we say, well, if this, if this content is not interesting, what, might I, what else might I attend to? And so we've identified 10 areas, things like affiliation. Anyone who's ever taught middle school knows that kids are more likely to be engaged in work if they can work with their friends. So you begin to build affiliation in to get <coughs> kids to work on the things you want. And so basically what you have to have is a heuristic device. And what, we, what I really have tried to do with my working on the work framework is provide a heuristic device to help us talk about the motives that kids bring to the work rather than how do we motivate the work because the way to customize it is to design the work in such a way, way that it appeals to those motives. And I think I did that pretty well. Gift basket number five, assorted books and CDs from Half Price Books, and two $10 iTunes gift cards. And this goes to Amy Ironman. Amy, if you could please stand.